terrible is this place. It is the house of God, the gate of heaven. Words taken from the introit this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In describing today's holy feast, the dedication of the Lateran Basilica, St. John, the Roman Martyrology says the following, that it is the mother and head of all churches in the city and the world. The mother and head of all the churches in the city and the world. No less than five councils have been held there, and it is the Cathedral of Rome. It is the first church to be officially consecrated. The dedication of this ancient structure is so important that it replaces the normal Sunday Mass, thereby giving us an opportunity to meditate upon the reasons we take even the physical structures of our churches seriously. There is an ancient Latin phrase that comes to our aid. It goes all the way back to St. Prosper of Aquitaine. He died in 463. It is commonly expressed as lex orandi est lex credendi, which basically means the rule of prayer, lex orandi, is connected to the rule of belief, lex credendi. We pray according to what we believe. We pray according to how we believe or as we believe. In discussing this ancient phrase, Paul Pius XII taught that the entire liturgy has the Catholic faith for its content, inasmuch as it bears public witness to the faith of the church. So there's the liturgy and there's the faith. They're very much the same. And they ought to be the same. Again, the entire liturgy has the Catholic faith for its content. Pope Pius XII. As a result of this intimate connection between prayer and belief, Pope Pius goes on to say, during the discussion of a doubtful or controversial truth, the Church and the Holy Fathers have not failed to look to the age-old and age-honored sacred rites for enlightenment. In other words, what he's saying is that the sacred and ancient liturgy, he makes that point, we're talking ancient here, sacred and ancient liturgy has always been considered a theological source from which the church and her leaders seek help to define a truth as being revealed by God. For example, in this month of November, the church especially wants us to help the poor and holy souls in purgatory reach their heavenly home. And as a loving mother, as a loving mother, the Holy Church provides us many ways to do this. Among them, each priest is encouraged to offer three requiem masses on All Souls Day. She also opens up her treasuries, merits and graces to these same poor souls by offering plenary indulgences for the simplest acts and prayers. All of this shows that there is a purgatory. It does exist. And as the traditional prayers indicate, these souls are not yet in a place of refreshment. They're not yet in a place of light, rest, or peace that they still need to be delivered from the effects of sin and the pains of hell even. You can read that in the offertory for a requiem mass. In other words, the fires of purgatory are the same as those of hell. It's a furnace, a purifying fire, but only temporary. So, lex orandi, lex credendi. Also noticeable in all the church's sacred liturgy is the lack of any officially approved prayer for asking the poorest souls to pray for us. Although they are certainly members of the mystical body and certainly are praying, they went down into purgatory 
as to a prison. They look up to us to help them. It seems that since the church in her official prayers has no place to pray to them, but only for them, we should spend all of our efforts helping them get out of that painful furnace so that once released, they will most readily and happily intercede for us in heaven. We help them now, they help us later. Now think about it. If you die tomorrow and went to purgatory and someone prayed to you to answer their prayer and you had it answered, they would think, oh, they're in heaven. I don't have to worry about them anymore. We wouldn't want that, would we? Burning away down there, everybody thinks we're in heaven. And that's why the church traditionally has no prayers. It seems to me pretty clear. The church has no prayers for us officially to pray to the poor souls as intercessors. Now, since the church is the perfect society containing in herself all truth, beauty, and goodness, with all her parts being interconnected, we can add a few things on to this fundamental phrase of St. Prosper. In keeping with today's feast, we could say, Lex orandi, Lex credendi, Lex edificandi. By which we mean simply, as we pray, so we believe, and so we build. So we build. We build our churches according to how we pray and what we believe. Thus, the architecture of our churches should indicate the profound truths of our holy Catholic faith and the divine liturgy being offered inside. In this regard, the Lateran Basilica has some important points to consider and to teach us. Well, one of the things is it's built in the shape of a cross. The main act of worship transpiring inside our churches is the holy sacrifice of the Mass where Calvary is made present again. And so we build our churches to express this mystery, this cross-shaped for Christ crucified on Calvary. We also know and believe, as St. Paul teaches, that the church is the body of Christ and we're individually members of it. With the head being in the sanctuary, we have the tabernacle in the middle of the altar, housing Christ the head, present on earth even unto the end of time in the Eucharist. We also have the altar in the head area, for our worship is primarily of the intellect and the will, which is associated with the head. This is why in the canon we use the word reasonable. May our worship be reasonable. Thus, we may not always feel, uh, feel like something happens at the Holy Mass, but we know by faith something mysteriously wonderful does indeed take place. Now, the position of the lay folk, they are in the body in the nave of the church. We have doorways where the glorious wounds are located. So if Christ is laid out in this church, we have the wounds, that's the transepts. That's the doors and the transepts. We have the doors at the front of the church for his feet. We enter back into the church through the glorious wounds. We have the baptismal font, which is the side of Christ, where we first entered. And so we put holy water fonts at each door to remind ourselves, this is how I first entered into the body of Christ. And we renew our baptismal promises. In fact, we should even want to say that beautiful prayer, the anima Christi, within thy wounds I long to hide. Never to be parted from thy side. May I never leave the church. May I stay within. Come what may. And finally, we have confessionals in this regard. 
near the doorways. Because if we've fallen out of the church due to some unfortunate mortal sin, we can enter back into the body through one of the wounds. Through the confessional located near the door. At St. John Lateran, we also notice in the nave along the main pillars, there are statues of the 12 apostles. Here then we see the 12 foundation stones mentioned in the description of the heavenly Jerusalem in the apocalypse. Thus, the church is apostolic in her foundation. All of our prayers and articles of faith must somehow reach back to them to be truly Catholic. The church is not a place for novelties. In other words, that's what those apostles are standing there for. No novelties. No wonder why the church has had no less than five of her major councils held in St. John Lateran. The ceiling of this church, St. John Lateran, is intricate and beautiful and gold-leafed. It is among the most striking parts of the church. It represents the church triumphant. We believe that those who persevere in the body of the church, in the nave, in the church militant, in other words, will someday be taken up into the church triumphant. They'll be pure gold having passed through a furnace to be purified. And finally, in regards to St. John Lateran, the baptistry of this church is octagonal in shape symbolizing the eighth day of heaven. Here, through baptism, you have entered into the gates that lead to paradise. What is more, in the chapel of the baptistry of this beautiful church in Rome is a striking painting of a martyrdom. The message is clear. When we are baptized, we are to die before giving up our vows. Death before sin. Although there are certainly many more details we could consider, we can easily see, even from these few facts, that clear, defined, detailed, and ordered art or architecture represents clear, defined truths or doctrines. Truth is beautiful in itself, and so ought to be the art that represents it. Now, let's flip it over, though, huh? What's the other possibility? We can also observe how undefined, amorphous art or architecture equals undefined and amorphous doctrine. Art that is so abstract it could mean anything equals doctrine that is abstract and could mean whatever people want it to mean. Go to any metropolitan art museum and you will find a progression starting from detailed and inspiring works of art from the Middle Ages to artworks that become more and more abstract and strange, mostly starting around the 17th century and beyond. Reaching to our own day, of course. This is a clear sign of the attack that truth has been under all this time, starting in a major way with the Protestant revolt in the 16th century. Now, sadly, this revolt seems to have entered into our very church structures, into our buildings. One way to see this is to reflect on how the Holy Mass has two major elements, just as the cross it represents. The vertical element is the sacrifice. The horizontal element is the banquet aspect of the Mass. That is the rite of Holy Communion. Now, it's no secret that many today place all the stress on the banquet. Listen to Father Matteo back in the middle of the 20th century. He said, alas... For many good Christians, the Eucharist consists merely of Holy Communion. For too many, Holy Mass is, after all, but the liturgical key which opens the tabernacle door. Father Matteo, how right he is. Mass just becomes a key to open the door. 
If we concentrate only on the banquet part of Mass, what will our churches begin to look like? Banquet halls. They will be in the round. So that all can gather about the table. More on their level. Instead of ascending up to the high altar of God. And the head of the body. Since the emphasis has changed to the banquet, that is, the more human and horizontal elements of the Mass, the table altar is introduced. And it's often brought out from the head into the nave, into the body, making Mass more of the body than of the intellect and the will. Seeking to make it an emotional experience, and this is seen clearly by the choice of music. At today's Masses. In the old Mass, we have Gregorian chant. It hits you at the highest levels. The Novus Ordo Mass oftentimes is very emotionally based music. So that you'll feel something's going on. Thus, people often speak about coming to church to get something out of the Mass To feel like they've worshipped. Rather than coming to offer themselves and sacrifice in union with Christ and Him crucified. True worship is based on sacrifice. Not what can I get out of it. There are other elements that might be considered. Such as the strong emphasis placed on hearing everything. Thus, our new church structures tend to be more like lecture halls with good acoustics, expensive sound systems, and lighting and environmental control systems. Very horizontal, very human. Padded pews. Living room-like sanctuaries. Furthermore, if the Mass is primarily or only a banquet, according to some, what happens if someone is not able to receive Holy Communion? Why go to Mass at all? If I can't go to Communion, it's a banquet. If I can't eat, why go? This is a problem. Thus, the recent Synod on the Family and Marriage comes to mind. Is this really just about marriage does not the overemphasis on the banquet element of the Mass have some role to play here? The divorced and the remarried and others living in objective mortal sin want to be like everybody else. They want their place at the table without changing their life. Now it seems to me that creepy Al Crowley Satanist extraordinaire has something of this in mind when he formulated his own black mass of sorts. He called it the Gnostic Catholic Mass. In this evil ceremony, the participants openly profess that the whole of the law is to do what they want. The whole of the law is to do whatever they want. Do without wilt. And then, everyone present must, must receive of the goblet of wine and the communion bread. They don't steal hosts for his mass. But everybody has to come forth. And they need to state out loud, there is no part of me that is not of the gods. There is no part of me that is not of the gods. What a sham. What wishful thinking, but how close we're becoming like that. Scary. In any case, without doubt, we build our physical churches to represent a spiritual reality. Our beliefs and our prayers. This is one reason for the importance of dedicating a church. It represents outwardly what we believe and how we pray. The fact we're building round churches and putting altars in the middle like tables indicates that we're fleeing from the cross. 
The modern message being transmitted is simply mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Take it easy. Relax. Don't worry about it. That's the modern message. And that's being transmitted even in our church structures. Whereas the previous message for how many centuries was what? Penance, penance, penance. We have lost our verticality. And as a result, there's a huge crisis in faith. Pope Paul VI said on December 7th, 1968, that, quote, the church is in a period of self-demolition, end quote. In other words, we're like Moses coming back the next day and finding Hebrew fighting Hebrew. We're fighting each other. We're destroying each other. Because we're looking at each other across a table instead of going up under the altar of God. Pope Paul VI also said in 1972, there are cracks here and there in God's temple letting in Satan's smoke. Smoke causes confusion. It causes chaos. It causes blindness and it causes panic. Sadly, many run for the doors to escape only to fall into the eternal fires of hell. Escape, running away, is not the answer. In order to keep from fleeing, in order to keep from taking to our heels ourselves, we need to add yet one more phrase on our saying from St. Prosper. Lex orandi, lex credendi, lex edificandi, lex vivendi. By which we mean as we pray, so we believe, so we build, and so we live. With the altar in the head, we need to sacrifice everything, body and soul, to the highest levels. As the angels and saints have done before us, they sacrificed everything, their excellence. The angels sacrificed their excellence. That was their sacrifice. We need to do the same. Sacrifice our all. And those who did not do this became demons and damned souls. We cannot afford to remain mere Sunday Catholics, but we must seek to make our whole life Catholic just to survive the smoke-filled environment in which we're dwelling. Let us therefore remain in the church, come what may. Let us run to the statues of the apostles and cling to them by studying our apostolic faith and traditions. Let us look up and stay focused on that heavenly ceiling, placing our minds and hearts there through frequent prayer, meditating upon the cross and all the means necessary to reach what that ceiling in the Lateran Basilica stands for. The church triumphant. Finally, let's always be using our holy water, renewing our baptismal vows, ever willing to die rather than forsake them. In this way, we will more surely remain in the church come what may, seeking to conform ourselves to Christ and Him crucified. Yes, Terrible is this place. It is the house of God in the gate of heaven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.